Welcome to our Wear the Gown special. I'm Bill Taylor. Thank you so much for joining us. KENS 5 has teamed up with University Health System on this life-saving initiative. In the next 30 minutes, we'll share personal stories with you from men and women in the San Antonio area about a variety of health issues and the importance of taking care of your health. Every year in this country, at least 750,000 people are hospitalized with atrial fibrillation. And with an aging population, that number is expected to rise. Here's Jeremy Baker with the importance of recognizing the condition. We were at a time period where we um, thought we had less than 5 million people in the United States, not, not just 10 years ago. Now we're approaching 7 to 8 million people. Dr. Manoj Pandey, the head of the section of electrocardiophysiology at UT Health San Antonio, who also sees patients within the university health system, says the rapidly rising number is due to the increasing number of causes leading to the disease. Hypertension, um, heart disease, heart failure, Obesity and obstructive sleep apnea are common causes of atrial fibrillation. Some of the symptoms of AFib include heart palpitations or an uncomfortable irregular heartbeat, weakness and fatigue, dizziness and lightheadedness, reduced ability to exercise, and shortness of breath. Delia Gonzalez had those symptoms and much more when she was diagnosed in 2014. I was having problems at night. I would lay down and I could feel my heartbeat beating. Okay, I go home, go to work and then come home and I'm tired and I'm like not wanting to do anything. Her husband was there for support and even researched the condition to find out more about it. He was always concerned because he was always taking me to the doctors, always taking me to the hospital. We, he was always checking on me. He always checked my sugar, checked my blood pressure. After having three strokes, her AFib was not something to mess with because AFib actually increases your risk of having a stroke. In fact, the risk of having a stroke for someone with AFib is five times greater than someone who does not have the condition. Atrial fibrillation can result in disability, stroke, and death. That's why recognizing it early and treating it is key. Advancements in medical technology are essential in saving lives. That's why there's a new procedure being tested out in trial to battle an irregular heartbeat. Here's more on the AMAZE trial. If you have atrial fibrillation, also referred to as AFib, you may benefit from participating in a medical research study. Delia Gonzalez had AFib for years and had seen many specialists who tried to treat it. She thought the AMAZE trial was perfect for her. When Dr. Pandy came into the picture, with a, I said, OK, I need to know him. And he's the one that got me into the program for the maze. The AMAZE trial is being conducted at just a, a, a limited number of centers across the country. And we are fortunate to be a part of it. Dr. Manoj Pandey says many in San Antonio could qualify for the trial. It's specifically for patients with symptomatic atrial fibrillation that's longstanding. That means they've had it for over a year and that's persistent. The purpose of this study is to determine if the combination of two non-surgical treatments, pulmonary vein isolation, PVI, and closure of the left atrial appendage utilizing the Lariat procedure. The Lariat procedure closes the left atrial appendage. That's right there. After it's closed, a scar forms around the closure location, which is a recognized source of AFib. For Gonzalez, the procedure was a success. Strokes. More than a year out from her procedure, uh, she has not had any atrial fibrillation at all. If you have persistent and or long-standing persistent AFib, to learn more about the trial, call UT Health Cardiology at 210-450-4888. Thanks to medical advancements, the number of Americans dying from a stroke has really gone down. Here's a look at the warning signs and the risk factors. Strokes kill about 140,000 Americans every year. That's one out of every 20 deaths. However, close to 800,000 people in the U.S. have a stroke every year. That means someone in the U.S. has a stroke every 40 seconds. So by the end of this story, three more people in our country will have suffered a stroke. Dr. Matea De Leoni Stanonic, a University Health System neurologist and UT Health fellow, says recognizing the signs of a stroke is imperative. FAST is a quick and easy scale to identify the most common presenting symptoms of stroke. With FAST, the F stands for face. When somebody has an acute onset, meaning that it happens all of a sudden, where you can see facial asymmetry, the A stands for arm. If you see arm that's, that's weak or drooping, 
um, then we're very concerned about stroke. The S stands for speech. Where somebody is not speaking. Or difficulty getting words out. And the T stands for time. Acting quickly is critical. There's a well-known statistic out there that every minute, two million brain cells die if, we, if somebody's having a stroke and we do not intervene. The most common risk factors for a stroke include high blood pressure, diabetes, elevated fats and cholesterol in the blood, smoking and family history. Unfortunately, one cannot really change your genetics. So know your risks and know the signs so you can keep your chance of having a life-ending stroke down. The sooner we can intervene, usually the better the outcome of the patient. Welcome to our roundtable discussion where today we're focusing in on some major advances providing hope on very important health issues. I want to introduce our doctors joining us today. First, Dr. Lee Birnbaum, University Hospital Director of Vascular Neurology and Associate Professor with UT Health San Antonio. Dr. Manoj Pandey, University Hospital Medical Director of Cardiac Electrophysiology Laboratory and Associate Professor with UT Health San Antonio. And Dr. Ahmed Mansour, University Hospital Urologist and Assistant Professor with UT Health San Antonio. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Birnbaum, let's start with you. I, I wanna begin with a thrombectomy. I've never heard of that. What is a thrombectomy? Yeah, so uh, thrombectomy is uh, really two words. Uh, the first is thrombus, which is clot, and then ectomy is removal, so it's clot removal. And uh, we perform this procedure in the brain when patients have a certain kind of stroke. And it's not just um, any stroke, it's a stroke that we call a large vessel occlusion, uh, which stands, um, which is represented by LVO, large vessel occlusion. Now is that LVO, if I could just for a second, the most common stroke or is this a rare form of stroke? An LVO or large vessel occlusion is about 20 to 30 percent of the time for stroke. And when we identify these, um, these patients can receive an IV medication that we use for uh, many strokes, but they also can uh, benefit substantially from this procedure called a thrombectomy. Strokes have been described as a wildfire, and, and unless they're put out, damage can be done second by second, so time is so crucial. That's true. So we are developing protocols with our EMS that are called bypass protocols, so that they won't be brought to a primary stroke center, that they'll come to the comprehensive stroke center, such as University Hospital. Tell me the latest advances. To perform a thrombectomy, it's a catheter procedure that we use x-ray. The general approach is um, uh, through the femoral artery in the uh, uh, groin or leg region, and we use x-ray to advance uh, special um, tools that we call um, catheters, and also a device that's a stent type device, which go all the way up to the brain where these clots are. And we use those devices to uh, remove the clot, either uh, aspirate it or suction the clot out, or actually retrieve uh, the clot with a, a stem type, stent type device. And removing the clot restores blood flow. Uh, patients do substantially better after restoration of blood flow. They're much quicker to uh, leave the hospital. Their uh, inpatient and outpatient rehab needs are much less. They're able to get home quicker, get back to work uh, much quicker. Let me shift to Dr. Panday and atrial fibrillation. This yes. is not something brand new. A lot of people understand what atrial and go into AFib as it's called. Describe it for us. Uh, Bill, just as you said, atrial fibrillation is very common. Uh, about six to seven million people in the United States have atrial fibrillation. The numbers are really increasing. And uh, the interesting thing about atrial fibrillation is I have patients in their 20s who have atrial fibrillation and patients in their 90s who have atrial fibrillation and everything in between. Both men and women are equally affected. And atrial fibrillation has a lot of implications. Number one, it can make you feel miserable. So there are some patients who are completely debilitated when they are in atrial fibrillation. They can't do their regular activities, they can't walk their dog, they can't do household chores. And then on the other side, which is life-threatening, is those patients, like Dr. Birnbaum was talking about, can, are actually five times higher to have a large embolic stroke. And that, like I said, can be life-threatening and uh, patients can have permanent disability. 
And what we're trying to do is trying to improve patients' quality of life and it, as much as we can try to decrease their chance of ending up in Dr. Birnbaum's hands with a large embolic stroke because it's better to prevent it if we can from atrial fibrillation. Tell me about the Lariat procedure. Now, this is, uh, there's a trial going on called AMAZE, and describe to me, as you were doing it earlier, about how this Lariat procedure works. The Lariat uh, is like a lasso, and it is uh, a procedure that was recently developed, and we've been doing it for approximately three years at our center, but it's still not widely commercially done because it's in the phase of uh, studies to determine what utility it has in treating patients with atrial fibrillation. Now there's two important things about the procedure. One is that in closing, what we do is uh, close the left atrial appendage. That area of the heart is oftentimes very hard to treat. It's a small pocket of the heart on the left side of the heart. And what we do is we get access through the groin and bring a catheter up into the heart. We take a long needle and puncture across from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart. And we enter into the left atrial appendage, which is a thin area, a pocket of the heart. And then we get access from underneath the breastbone onto the surface of the heart without doing an open heart surgery. And we place a catheter above the surface of the heart and we take two magnets and we meet them at the left atrial appendage. And then we take this lasso type device called the lariat and slowly introduce it over that wire that we've magnetically attached to the inside of the heart from the outside of the heart. And we close the left atrial appendage by taking a lasso, if you will, over the appendage and cinching it down. And what that does is it closes the atrial appendage and eliminates it effectively. And so the triggers, the electrical stimuli that come from the left atrial appendage are eliminated, as well as the ability of blood to accumulate in that area and create clots is also eliminated. And 80 to 90 percent of strokes that come from atrial fibrillation actually come from that left atrial appendage. We have a phone number for you so you can get started receiving real solid information about your health. It's 210-358-3045. You can also head to the website, wearthegown.com. Coming up, dealing with prostate cancer. We break down three treatment options after diagnosis. Welcome back to our Wear the Gown special. Every year in the United States, more than 160,000 men are diagnosed with prostate cancer. Now when that happens, it's not time to hit the panic button. Experts here at University Health System have many ways of treating prostate cancer. Finding prostate cancer is not the end of the road. The most important thing is to tailor the treatment according to the aggressiveness of the prostate cancer. Dr. Ahmed Mansur, an assistant professor at UT Health San Antonio, who also sees patients within the university health system. Since prostate cancer typically progresses very slowly, sometimes active surveillance is all that's needed. With active surveillance, they are being followed with uh, regular PSAs and exams, and based on the behavior of cancer, they're offered treatment down the road or not. The second form of treatment is surgery, called a prostatectomy. Surgical treatment has progressed a lot over the past few years, especially with the maturation of robotic surgery, which has now become the normal standard in offering prostatectomy for patients. This involves separating the prostate from the bladder and urethra and reconnecting them again. With this surgery, one side effect is sexual dysfunction, but with the advancement of robotic surgery like you are seeing here, that side effect is becoming less severe. We um, are able to preserve the nerves surrounding the prostate in a more efficient way. Option number three is targeted radiation. Technologies which are being utilized by uh, radiation oncologists in order to target the prostate or with radiation. Bottom line, a prostate cancer diagnosis is not the end of the world. It is the start of a conversation of which path to take with your doctor to get treatment. When we men turn 60, nearly half of us will experience an enlarged prostate. Jeremy Baker shows us how University Health System is leading the way in treatment. 
Bruce Wagner spent most of the last 10 years dealing with an enlarged prostate. I've been under treatment for this for quite a while. His main complaint was an inability to urinate properly. You think you're empty, you have to get up two, three, four, and in my case, five or more times at night. The main symptoms of an enlarged prostate or benign prostatic hyperplasia include frequent or an urgent need to urinate, difficulty starting urination, a weak urine stream or a stream that starts and stops, and inability to completely empty the bladder. After close to 10 years of medication, he knew it was time for surgery. Not being able to empty was my uh, point where I just said I had enough. The standard method has been TERP or resection of the prostate. That's cutting it with a hot wire and removing pieces of it at a time. But along with that comes an increased risk of bleeding, longer recovery time and a prostate size limitation. I looked up a lot of research about that and did not like the results because it's a very messy, bloody procedure. A newer procedure, which is only done by a handful of institutions around the country, including at San Antonio's University Hospital, is called laser enucleation of the prostate. Going between the shell or the capsule of the prostate, the pink portion, and the white bulb of the prostate, like peeling an orange from the inside. I was in, had the surgery, and out the next day. Wagner has this message for men going through what he did. Get seen by their doctor uh, sooner rather than later if they have problems. Welcome back to our roundtable discussion, shifting gears with Dr. Mansour and enlarged prostate. You, you say that this is almost unavoidable. Yeah, it is unavoidable. As the hair goes gray, the prostate gets bigger. It's uh, part of the aging and growing process. What would be the telltale signs other than problems urinating? Are there any other symptoms or is that the, the so, biggest red flag? So the initially, the most common symptom would be waking up at night frequently to go to the bathroom. And then we'll be starting noticing weak urine stream, having to stay in the bathroom for longer times frequency going to the bathroom more frequently urgency the sense of that you need when you need to go you need to go right away and sense of incomplete evacuation that the bladder is always full even though you just went to the bathroom early detection is key but now what you're saying is if we get to a point where whoa this is very late this is very large we now have a lot more hope Exactly, and again, with, with benign prosthetic enlargement, there, there is a lot of procedures, and that's why confusion um, uh, is there. However, um, uh, with laser inoculation of the prostate, even for moderate-sized prostates, uh, you get maximum removal of all the blocking tissues, and this leads to maximum improvement in outcomes in terms of obstruction and blockage. So it's a lifetime solution uh, compared to other less efficient and effective treatments in which you have the symptoms recurring and the need for retreatment is about about 6 to 18 percent within five years. Uh, so with laser inoculation, it is less than 1 percent. So university health system is really blazing the trail in this procedure? Of course. I mean, and again, we're getting referrals from all over the states uh, just because we are now, and most of the referrals we get actually nowadays, initially we, we get, we'll start getting the referrals from urologists. Right? That's they know right. about the procedure, they send us patients. But now, most of the referrals that I'm getting now are from friends of friends of patients who get this procedure. So they go to the golf course, they talk about, uh, yeah, you, uh, about, about urinating and how, <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah. What guys talk about. Exactly, so, <laughs> how, yeah, so how, how many times do I have to go to the bathroom before my next turn, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then they tell them, yeah, come see my man. That's what happens all the time. Uh, so most of the referrals nowadays are from patients who refer patients. And we have uh, had very, very generous patients who donated to our program, uh, research program in this area. And we're quite thankful for them. And that's how we progress the field. We want to help you get started on a path to good health. Call 210-358-3045 or go online to wearthegown.com with your health questions. Living with Hepatitis, a man's journey to getting rid of the life-threatening disease. Welcome back. You know, more than three million Americans are living with Hepatitis C. Jeremy Baker now shows us the specific group most likely to be diagnosed with this life-threatening disease. Hepatitis C is a blood-borne infection. It can be transmitted through sex through use of contaminated needles. Clarissa Carvalho, a family nurse practitioner with University Health System, says there is no vaccine for the disease, but a blood test for the illness could save your life. 
If it goes uh, untreated, uh, you can have hepatocellular carcinoma, which is uh, liver cancer. You can have cirrhosis of the liver, which is the liver actually failing to work. Some of the symptoms of hepatitis C include bleeding and bruising easily, fatigue, itchy skin and yellow discoloration of the skin, dark colored urine, fluid buildup in the abdomen and swelling of the legs and confusion or drowsiness. Sometimes you can have absolutely no symptoms. You may not even know you have hepatitis C unless you're uh, checked for it. If you are a baby boomer, meaning you were born between the years 1945 and 1965, you have a five times greater chance of having hepatitis C. In fact, three out of every four people with hepatitis C were born during those two decades. After 1965, you know, we were using more disposable needles. We were more stringent with universal precautions for infection control. If you test positive for hepatitis C, to cure it, all you have to do is take one pill a day for a maximum of 12 weeks. Most patients say it's just like taking any other medication. Hepatitis C is deadly, but curable. Thousands of San Antonians are walking around every day, unaware that they even have it. Here's a story of a man shocked to find out he had the disease, but he took the right steps to become hep C free. It was like, man, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Like Guadalupe Guzman found out he had hepatitis C one year ago. The disease attacks the liver. I was scared because uh, my sister died of liver cancer. So it was like, uh oh. I'm next. His liver functions were a little abnormal, so we ran a hepatitis C antibody check, which turned out positive. Clarissa Carvalho, a family nurse practitioner with University Health System, has been seeing Guzman from the moment he was diagnosed. Your liver numbers are also great. Drug use, you know, sleeping around with different women all the time, unprotected sex, I, that's why I think I got it from. You could be at risk for having hepatitis C if you had a blood transfusion before 1992, used needles to take illegal drugs, have body piercings or tattoos, were born between 1945 and 1965, or have a spouse or partner who has it. Guzman was afraid of the treatment. I was thinking like, you know how you go for dialysis? I'm gonna have to sit somewhere the way they pump this stuff in. But that's just not the case. The cure for hepatitis C is simple. Just one pill a day. And you don't have to take it for very long, a maximum of three months. When I started meds, it was like, man, this is easy. And now he has this message for anyone who thinks they may be at risk too. Take the time to take care of yourself. Because like they say, if you don't take care of yourself, you know, how are you gonna take care of somebody else? Getting treatment for hepatitis C is critical for those who have it, and even more so if they're suffering with other ailments. University Health System does a great job of navigating the patient towards a cure. Vanji Ramirez is a patient navigator with Hep Vista in the University Health System. It's funded by CPRIT. CPRIT is Cancer Prevention and Research Institute of Texas. The institute helps patients get treatment for and cured of Hep C. The struggle is usually in trying to get people to their appointments. She struggled to get Guadalupe Guzman into treatment for two years. Once you get started, the doctors are very good about keeping you oh, on yeah. track. I wasn't feeling any symptoms. I wasn't sick. How could this be going on when, you know, I feel fine? Hepatitis C is a silent disease, as are other diseases. But that doesn't mean that it's not progressing. There are 3 million people living with hepatitis C in the U.S., but only half of them actually know it. About 20% will clear the disease without treatment, but with treatment, over 90% can be cured of the disease with 8 to 12 weeks of therapy. Medicare and Medicaid will, for the most part, fund the, the medication. Medicaid has certain restrictions. A person has to present with a certain, what we call an F score. The F score measures scarring in the liver. The closer your number is to the high end, which is four, the more likely the cost of the drug will be covered. While we're talking, it is continuing to damage their liver. That's why it is so important for those with the disease to get treatment and be cured as soon as possible. To get started on a lifetime of wellness, call 210-358-3045 or go to wearthegown.com.
Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you enjoyed our special, but more importantly, I hope it encouraged you to become more healthy, to be aware of health issues. On behalf of Ken's Five Television and University Health System, I'm Bill Taylor, encouraging all of you to wear the gown.